All right. There you have it. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the May edition of our small business webinar series, Connecting for Success. I'm Barbara Coffey, Director of Economic Initiatives for the City of Tucson. Today, we are going to hear from experts and resource partners on programs for restaurants and small business with a really great lineup of speakers for you, representing federal, local, and neighborhood level experience. We will take your questions as we go, so feel free to enter those in the chat box or the Q&A section. We'll get to as many of those as possible in our time together this afternoon. We will keep all participants muted since we do have a large number of attendees, uh, but we will record the session and make it available for everyone Usually we post those by tomorrow afternoon. You can find links to all our previous webinars at connecttucson.com. So let's get started. First up, Stephen Hart. Stephen is based in Tucson where he has been the Small Business Administration Senior Area Manager for Southern Arizona for the past 15 years. He came to the job following a move from Washington DC where he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Education and Cultural Affairs at the US State Department. He also served as Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the U.S. Department of Transportation and at the White House during the 1980s and 90s in press relations and legislative affairs positions. In the private sector, he was Senior Vice President at the Association of American Railroads and consulted with SBC Telecommunications on growth strategies in its successful efforts to purchase AT&T. So from what I hear and what it sounds like, Stephen, is that all things DC, all things happening in Washington, you might be in the know. So we're gonna turn it over to you to get us started today. Uh, welcome, Stephen. Well, I don't know what I know, but I know what I don't know. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me start out. Uh, today marks a, a kind of strange day, a coincidence where a program that has been going for only three weeks has essentially run out of money. And the application window for the restaurant revitalization, revitalization fund closes today at 5 p.m. local time. Uh, we've had 300,000 applicants. Uh, they have requested $69 billion worth of grants. The fund only has about 28.6 billion as passed by Congress. So there's a huge competition. It's done on a first come first serve basis. Typically with these programs, when there is a set amount of money, <clears throat> there are folks who do not receive the grants or the loans. That money is then held for those later so that there's still be, when we have you know, 60, $69 million worth of requests, some of those will be granted above uh, until we reach the, the 28.6. Uh, for those who have pens in hand and are anxious to do uh, an application today, there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first is to go online at the following site, which is restaurants, plural, dot SBA dot gov. Uh, you'll find a, um, I'm not going to say relatively easy, but Given relative, when it comes to some government programs, it's not bad. If you've been through the PPP, uh, you'll find this a little more straightforward. That was a changing target for a long time. The second way to do this is through a phone uh, call to 844-279-8898. Uh, right now, we're in a period, there were two tranches of uh, opportunities for businesses to apply. We haven't reached the second one. We've tapped out in the first, which was reserved for underserved uh, communities or, or populations, which included women, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged groups. So they've consumed uh, what we have so far. Let me uh, try and go through this with you. Well, can you see that? There we go. There it is. Yes, it's coming up. And and Stephen, I'll also ask you to. Oh, here here's that information too. We'll, and when you're done, if you'll put that in the chat. But I I see restaurants.sba.gov listed right there, and there's that great telephone number. All right. And it's done through some point of sale, which uh, I don't recommend at this point because uh, it's better streamlined right now with the agency. Um, let me go. This here. 
Uh, this is a list of who's eligible that includes a very broad list, restaurants, food stands, uh, food trucks, carts, caterers, bars, saloons, lounges, taverns. There are some restrictions on who of those can apply. Snack and non-alcoholic beverage bars, coffee shops, ice cream shops, bakeries. Again, here's the beginning of the limitation, which is that uh, on-site sales at some of these locations must amount to 33% of gross receipts uh, before you can be considered. Brew pubs, tasting rooms, tap rooms, breweries, microbreweries, wineries, distilleries, inns, uh, distilleries, wineries, and inns also must meet that 33% gross receipts uh, uh, threshold. And then there are some um, other ones here that I will uh, rely upon you to scan through this, uh, given the time constraint. Um, businesses, state, these are ineligible. State and local operated government um, businesses are not eligible for these funds. Uh, you have to have uh, been in business since uh, February, 2021. Uh, or in this case, March 13th. You cannot have more than 20 locations. The affiliation requirements are very strenuous. Uh, you can have a number of different businesses under the business name, but if you have affiliates that are not part of the business name, they still count towards that total 20 uh, location aggregate. You can't get it if you're a publicly traded firm, if you're permanently closed, if you're a nonprofit organization, and uh, if your grant is eligible for $1,000 or less, uh, or less than $1,000, that will not be dispersed. <clears throat> uh, again, there's a tap, cap of $10 million per organization with $5 million per location, the maximum. Uh, now, this is a little different. Some of you know SAM.gov if you've ever been involved with the PPP program or the, or the um, uh, Shuttered Venue Grant program. Uh, we don't require that at this point. We won't require some of the, the numbers, that, uh, the case code, the DUNS numbers that are typically the threshold requirements. You can have alternative IRS approved numbers uh, your individual tax identification number. And there's uh, here's a little warning about what's happening uh, with having to re-up that number. Uh, eligible C-Corps, S-Corps, partnerships, LLCs, sole proprietors, self-employed individuals, um, certain organizations that they may belong to, independent contractors, tribal businesses. I had one just the other day that was operating out of their home that had received the grant, good news. Um, bear with me as I, oops. Um, now, here's one that is not unexpected, but if you're in bankruptcy, you cannot get the grant unless you're under a court approved uh, process. Uh, if you permanently close your doors, uh, obviously that's not gonna work either. If you're temporarily close your doors, uh, there's an opportunity for you to apply. Uh, these are the, this is an affiliate section, and I would simply want to skip this and refer you to it as you go through the application so that you don't step outside the bounds. It is complex. Uh, here's another. We have three or four different scenarios that are in this slide deck. I would just caution you to make sure you don't step outside of those bounds as the government can be very rigid with these things. Uh, another affiliation. Um, now, there are subtractions uh, to uh, your gross receipts calculations that involve previously uh, awarded loans, EIDL loans, PPP loans, um, and uh, the shuttered grants program. Some of these, if you're if you received a shuttered shuttered grant, you cannot receive a RRF grant, um, the PPP and EIDL will be subtracted from the value of the grant 
basically the government is saying, hey, you can't double dip. Uh, and um, some of the certifications that have been required in the past have been eased. So you can essentially self-certify that what you're saying is true. There are some requirements uh, that when you have them, you use uh, CPA papers or audited returns. But again, you have the option of certifying. Uh, with that, you know, comes the warning, don't step without, outside the bounds. Um, this is a little awkward given that we've already pretty much exhausted the, the funds. But now this is important, your business expenses, what's eligible, your payroll, your utility payments, your maintenance expenses, and that some people say, can I maintain my truck? And yes, you can. Uh, all this is uh, relying on the review process and the application approval. Business supplies, food, beverage, supplier costs, there are some limitations on that. The application will go through that with you. And business operating expenses, which includes uh, insurance, marketing, licensing fees, legal fees, and point of service. Um, you can also uh, finance construction of outdoor uh, seating, uh, which uh, I guess is uh, not quite going as much as it was, which is a good thing, but uh, that is eligible as well. Uh, you have to spend the money by March 11th, 2023, or else you return the funds. Uh, if you're permanently closed, um, that's not an option. Uh, although during the period between the rece receipt of the grant and closure, you can use those funds for operating expenses and eligible expenses. Uh, and there is that return to government matter. Here's the certification. You do need to detail how you use the funds. There are reviews. Uh, as we've gone through this entire uh, process through the CARES Act it's, uh, that has brought on new programs for small businesses, uh, the constraints and requirements have become more strident, I think is a good word, uh, as there are bad actors out there who are taking money away from those who deserve it. So reviews are uh, a little bit more invasive. Um, and the use of funds assessment, again, here is a reporting requirement. Uh, more guidance is coming from that. Now, I'm going to skip through these uh, because there are three sections uh, on how you calculate the funds. And they're all predicated on when you were in business, uh, what gross receipts you're using, how you subtract from those, and so on and so forth. So bear with me. I, I think all of us are better off right now not going through that. Uh, continue, let's see. And here's, here are exclusions. I mentioned these before. These cannot, these are not calculated in your gross receipts. You don't get to count the Paycheck Protection Program, first or second draw, any debt relief uh, assistance, which is section 1112. Again, the EIDL loan cannot be uh, calculated in gross receipts. And then there are some specific payments. Um, and this FRRP has to do with blind uh, business owners. Uh, again, here's uh, the points of sale in the restaurants.sba.gov. And the telephone number again is 844-279-8898. The online application will be quicker, but for those who want to talk to a human being, you can do that. Um, it's working very well. Uh, okay. Um, here's more forms and acronyms, but the form 3172 refers to the online application. Most everybody who's gotten assistance through this pandemic period has, has, to, has had to do a 4506T, which allows us to look at your taxes 
to verify what you're putting in your in your application is accurate or reflective of the tax uh, reporting that you've done. You do have to do these multiple times as these are discrete programs and they don't share on the platforms. Um, here are some of the uh, documents that you can use to prove uh, what you're saying is the truth. Forgive, forgive me for putting it that way, but that's what it comes down to. Business tax returns, IRS 1040s, partnership forms. Uh, again, here are the prepared uh, financial statements internally or externally. Obviously, externally are, are preferred, but you can self-certify. And then point of sales, these are done through, uh, for instance, Square. Uh, I think the other one is Cabbage, and there's a few others that uh, you might have as a restaurant that helps you quantify and save your sales or process your sales. Uh, <clears throat> let me let you look at this. Uh, these next three slides are kind of cumulative and repetitive. Essentially, I've said these before, CPA reports, uh, individual certifications, externally prepared financial statements, um, and uh, have your federal tax returns for 19, 20, and if you have them, uh, either in quarterly payments for 21, or the most th recent three months of bank statements. Um, if anybody's an in, or a bakery, brew pub, tasting room. These are somewhat different uh, requirements in that uh, they're not all that much similar, or they are, but it, it, they are different from the traditional restaurant setting as we all know them and patronize. Oh, here we go with our links again. And we're getting close to the end. Okay. No news here. You have to document what you're doing with the, when you deal with the government and with a bank or with any, typically with any institution or business. Uh, you know, use what you have that are your resources. Uh, and uh, we're not able to make corrections, which means get it right the first time. Uh, that sounds rather blunt, but it's an inflexible system. And there are those others that have done it right that will be processed uh, and deservedly so before any corrections could have been made if they were to be made. If you do uh, have a PPP loan in process and even though that program is shut down there is a backlog and we're working through the applications and the processing um, it must be in before you apply for this RRF or you cancel it. Uh, canceling is recommended, uh, although, and that's only to streamline the RRF, and it can change your gross receipts calculations. We went through this pilot period, which is the first one to 21 days, which is for that those discrete groups of women, uh, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged. If you're interested in the definition of that, there are resources that are available uh, from the government online. If you've ever done anything through the System Awards Management or SAM, um, it's available through that as well. You do not have to, again, go through uh, self-certifications or certifications that are formal, typically economically and socially disadvantaged fall into something called the 8A program, which you may be familiar with if you've done any federal contracting. And that requires a very formal process. That's not required here. You're gonna be held to your word that that's who you are. I think we have two more slides uh, and I just covered that. The only thing I'd add here is that you must, the ownership must be 51% or more. So, and you can add this up by the number of different individuals. So if you have a woman owned at 30% and a veteran at 21, you've reached the 51% threshold. And here's the reference to self-certification. 
and here's an overview. Uh, I will let you refer to this as it applies. So we won't go over that. Um, and you can't try and game the system. That's what this says. Don't reorganize in order to get a new EIN. Don't try and change your status of ownership to a veteran or a woman or disadvantaged if you're not already that way. I think we can all understand what the consequences of that would be. And we don't want anybody to get there if they're needing money to stay alive in the restaurant business. Um, uh, let's see, I went through this. These are different echelons or set-asides that were from Congress. Uh, and again, I, I think it's more expeditious to allow you to look at the slide deck uh, and find the discrete information that applies. And that's a quick run through as best I can do and encapsulate for you. I hope it's okay, Barbara. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I thought about, I mean, it looks like um, there has been some flexibility, like even I thought under the ownership, being able to check multiple boxes and reach that 51%. I think that was a great uh, piece of advice. Some may have missed that. And um, I'm certainly going to send out the slide deck to those that have asked. And certainly if they, you know, if they haven't applied now, then the next hour and a half will be very important for getting this work done. So I'm hoping you're opening your screens now to start uh, looking at the portal. Um, and I also thought the information you shared about the um, PPP versus the RRF um, and one or the other um, was important information as well. And it seems a little tricky, Stephen. I mean, I'll just ask you this. While you cancel one, think if you already have the PPP in motion, would you recommend staying the course with that? Yes, I would. Uh, I, I cannot attest to whether or not that streamlines if, if you cancel. It has been part of our PowerPoints, but I don't know the consequences as far as, as how fast it will, that will improve the process. And I personally, I wouldn't, you know, if you have a chance to get a PPP loan and the only effect is that it reduces your gross receipts that you will use to apply for an RRF, go for both is my, my take on it. Awesome. All right, well, we're gonna keep moving. Um, so I will have you close your screen now and I'll introduce our next speaker. And again, for everyone listening, please keep the questions coming. We'll have a chance to, to get those asked for you today. So next up, I have Jewel Medu. She's a transplant to Tucson. Jewel relocated here from Atlanta to join the Pima Community College family as the academic director of hospitality leadership which is hotel, restaurant, culinary arts, and therapeutic massage. Jewel leads the charge of building the program's hospitality leadership center of excellence. And with more than 23 years of industry experience, Jewel has worked across the nation, also from DC all the way to Las Vegas, representing several reputable hotel and restaurant companies, including Marriott International, Hilton Worldwide, Darden Restaurants, Station Casinos, and others, before crossing over into higher education. She attended East Carolina University, earning a bachelor's degree in hospitality management, has received a master's degree in human resource management, and is currently finishing her doctor of education degree in educational leadership and management. So you have a, a, a great background, a wealth of experience here in hospitality and restaurant food and beverage to draw from. So I'm glad that you're able to share with our businesses today. Welcome, Jewel. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I don't know how I'm supposed to follow Stephen. Stephen, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that information. Well, thank you. And the fact that you're from DC, I'm from DC. You have a special place in my heart. Um, but no, like Barbara said, I'm Jewel Madu. I do run the hospitality program at Pima Community College, and I've been there about three and a half years now. Um, Stephen did a really good job of giving us information from that side, and I thought that was awesome. So I'm going to go from the standpoint of the education and what I'm seeing and what we've been seeing over this last year and some change. Um, we just did uh, our advisory committee meeting. Our advisory committee meeting is our advisory committee is made up of all industry partners to our program, to our school. Um, so we had, I think, we have a ton of them on, on the advisory, but I think we had about 23 or 24 
different professionals from all different types of um, restaurants and hotels in the Tucson metro area. And interestingly enough, what we've been finding um, is that this is, this is Mental Health Awareness Month. And some of the very, very, very transparent um, information that we've received is stuff that I wouldn't call it shocking you all, but it is a situation that I don't think we had to think about or deal with as heavy as we are now. And that's our mental health awareness. Um, we've been, as the, as the academic director and the leader of the program, I can't tell you all how many of our partners have reached out to us. I mean, on a daily basis, looking for staff and workers, everyone across the Tucson area in the hospitality industry right now is hurting, hurting for people that can work, people that have the skills to be able to kind of jump in quickly. That's the other challenge that we're seeing. But then when you think about the flip side, those that are currently working in that short staff environment are feeling more than overwhelmed. And that's something that we discussed in great detail on our advisory committee this past Monday, uh, one week ago, was they're hurting. They don't want to come. That people are leaving. They don't want to come back. They don't want to come and work in this industry because of how fast paced it is, how stressful it is. And over this last year, I think when we kind of got shut down so abruptly, people started to realize, hmm, don't know if this is really what I want to do. So what we've done from the standpoint of Pima Community College as a whole, but in our program in hospitality leadership, is we've started creating smaller, more simplistic ways for any student or any learner to be able to come in and not have to work on focusing on this huge, long degree, right? People don't have the time. People no longer have the luxury of, of taking a, a year or two to, to get skills in order to get a, a job. So what we've been doing as a college and in our program is creating micro -credential, credentials and creating simplistic um, certificates that someone can come in and take in a semester or two semesters be done and be able to go right into the workforce. Um, so one of the things that we did um, as a specific example in our program is we created on the culinary side, we created a 16 credit hour certificate where we offer it in an accelerated modality. What that means is the same 16 credit hours that would take you probably a year or so to complete, you can now do that in 16 weeks. 16 weeks and you come out with 16 credit hours, you come out with a, um, a culinary fundamental certificate, and you also come out with your five-year management level serve safe certification. Just that serve safe certification alone is a significant, is a significant differential for those going into a restaurant, whether they have a lot of skill or not. Um, and so those are some of the things that we're seeing. We're listening, we're actually listening to the community and listening to the students, no matter what level, what age, what race, what sex, no matter what, we're listening to what everyone is saying and we're giving everyone an opportunity to be able to come in and take advantage of these micro credentials. And it doesn't have to necessarily only be in hospitality. Like I said, we have it, um, we're offering these types of certificates across the college and different programs. I didn't want to do a slide of that because there's so many, but you can literally just go to pima.edu and you can pull up any one of our programs, our certificates, our degrees. And that, those are some of the things we're trying to kind of focus on so that people know we're here to support you. We're not trying to, I, I come from sales. I have a long background in sales. And so I used to tell people, I'm in the business of making money. That's what we do as salespeople. However, in this situation, we're not in the business of making money right now. We're in the business of helping our fellow man. You know, we're, we're trying to take the stance. Um, one of the things I tell my team all the time is that we've got to lead with love. Right now, people are hurting. People are trying to support their families and they just need to know that someone supports them while they're trying to do something to be able to get the skills to get a new job. So from a, from a college standpoint, we're looking at what are the best ways to partner with our different industry partners? What are, what are our industry partners needing? You know, are some of the, 
some of the information that our partners have shared with us was, listen, we're, we're offering all types of incentives. They're offering sign-on bonuses. They're now, a lot of them are now offering benefits to part-time workers and temporary workers as an incentive. A lot of them are in, incentivizing uh, current employees to, to refer people that they know. And then once you refer that person and they're hired, there are some companies right in Tucson that are giving immediate referral bonuses and then will give another referral bonus after that person has been with the company for X amount of days. So we're trying to come up with the best solutions on both sides from an educational standpoint, as well as what can we do to entice people to want to work? Because I, I feel like now my partners are calling and I'm getting more jobs presented to us than we can actually send people to them for. I kind of think that's a great problem, but it's still a problem. And I, so we're trying to find ways to combat that. But one, like I said, one of the things we're doing is trying to create the most simplistic ways that somebody can come in and say, you know, we've got, like, let's say I'm a, I'm 45 year old woman who I've been in sales forever. And then that company has now gone out of business due to COVID. Well, I love baking and it's just been a hobby if I'm that person, right? So if I love baking and it's been a hobby, well, what we've done is we've created a baking and pastry certificate. So it's very specialized. That particular individual would not have to come in and take all of these unnecessary courses um, and spend all of this unnecessary time and extra money in order to specifically get some credentials and some additional skills in baking and pastry. Um, and like, again, like I said, we're doing that across the college, not just in hospitality. So if anyone on here is wondering that, you can find this in almost all of our programs. We're trying to create these ways to help people go into business. We're trying to help them figure out how to find jobs that they would have never thought they would need or want at this stage right now. So we've been having a lot of fun, but it's been really challenging. I know one of the things we're doing at the school is we've created centers of excellence. So we have a hospitality leadership center of excellence where we were able to secure a grant. It was one of my first grants and it was the hardest one I think I've ever done. Steven, my hat is off to you because what you've done, been there, done that. But we were able to get a $2.7 million grant that allow, that is allowing us to, we're building a brand new baking and pastry kitchen um, on the campus at the Desert Vista location. We're building, um, we're cleaning up the kitchen, we're, we're re renovating our grill, and we're building a student-run restaurant that we don't have anywhere in Tucson right now in terms of schools. Um, so we're building a restaurant where students can come in, the community can come in and, and enjoy different food and support the students. And the students can also get an opportunity to, to learn hands-on while they're actually getting credit for it. So a lot of moving parts, but we're, we're finding that it's these little ways and, and again, focusing on the mental health of not just the students, but the community. That's one of the things that we've noticed that many of us have missed that we've needed to go back to and, and address that. So a lot of companies are really um, relying heavy on their EAPs. A lot of people are, are, are seeing that the counseling services are being used more now than I think we ever have used in the past. Me included, I tell my students, I'm very transparent with our students. I am in the same boat that we've all had our moments where we just want to break down and cry or throw our computers. We don't want to get on any more Zoom calls. Those are moments. You can have your moment, but then you have to move on. But they're very serious to a lot of people when people are hurting. Um, and so it's really awesome to see that Stephen, you presented that information to where, so where restaurants um, can, can take advantage of that so that we can start to recover, to truly recover. Oh, I just can't even tell you guys how recovery is the word of the year for us, so. Absolutely, I appreciate that perspective. And Jewel, tell me a little bit, how's it been like engaging with the employers? Are you, 
Are you reaching them so that they know what you have to offer? And then the second piece is the student side, because you've mentioned a shortage and, and the challenge of trying to help businesses ramp back up with the people they need. Are you able to promote and recruit the kind of students you need to fill the gap there? Yeah, so those two questions. So the first one was, how do we engage with our partners? We, our partners are our friends. Our partners are our family, actually. We have amazing partners just and I'm, I'm speaking of my program of hospitality at Pima but also of the school but if speaking just of hospitality our partners are awesome um, when I got to the school I had to literally go out and touch every single one of them had conversations said you know I, I need to know I don't want to know the good I want to know the bad and the ugly I want to know what you all think we need to do to to make this program um, more conducive, not just to the school, but to the community, because if it's not conducive to the community, then what are we doing it for? Um, so we have amazing partners, Barbara. Again, like I said, our advisory committee is made up only of partners. And just so you all know, our advisory committee, they advise us, not the other way around, right? So they come when we have meetings, or even when they have things they want to talk about, they come to us and they say, hey, you know, the industry is changing. We need to have more students that are uh, that have serve safe certification. So then it's up to us to add that into our curriculum. So we do that to a T. If they say, hey, you know, your parts of your curriculum are antiquated and outdated, then it's up to us to change that. And we we've, we've completely done that over these last the last two years. We've completely changed our degree to be something that they, the school has never had. So that came, Barbara, from our advisory committee, which is our partners. Um, then when we think about the student side, um, yes. So what happens is because I have such a tremendous relationship with our partners, they send me their jobs every day. And I find myself going, oh, I wanna do that. Well, can I come and do that too? I wanna work there too. Um, so we have a distribution channel within our program and I send every job, every job fair, everything that our employers send me that gets shared with them. We also, um, when I changed the, the, the new degree, we just rolled our new degree out in August of 2020. And that new degree requirement has an internship requirement, 320 hour mi um, minimum internship that every student has to do on the front end. So most of, I, I know all of us have gone through school, right? Most of us have probably done an internship probably towards the end of our experience. Our students are in our program, I'm having them do it on the front end because what I found is that most people don't even know what hospitality means. When I say hospitality, they think, oh, you work in a hospital? And I'm like, no, no, no. So we've changed it so that students can get more involved and more engaged on the front end. And so what ends up happening is if a student does not already work in the industry, directly in industry, they have an opportunity to reach out to any one of these employers and they can use our partners as internship sites. And our partners have all agreed because they need, they need workers, right? So it's kind of a, it's a nice balance there. Um, but now we're at the place where because we've been home for over a year, everyone's kind of in a world where they're either working not able to work or they just don't want to work. Let's call a spade a spade, you all, right? We have a lot of people who just have gotten comfortable over the last year feeling like, you know, well, I've never had this much time with my family or I've never been able to travel this much or I've never been able to actually sleep. So people are taking advantage of that, I think a little longer than we expected. Um, but so we are able to, we are able to do the give and take from both the partner side and the student side. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate that. We're going to keep rolling. And I want to remind everyone, keep the questions coming. I'll introduce now Krista Hansen. Krista is lead planner for the Department of Transportation and Mobility. She's overseeing the development of the shared spaces, parklets, and streetery program, which she'll share with us today. Krista also manages the shared mobility program and leads the traffic safety efforts for the planning team. She was born and raised in Tucson and is dedicated to making traveling on our streets safer and more enjoyable for everyone. I don't think anyone would argue with that. So let's go to Krista. Great, thank you, Barbara. And just to confirm, can you see my presentation? Yes, okay, yes. Great. I always just want to make sure. Um, 
Yes, as Barbara said, my name is, is Krista. I'm a, a planner in the Department of Transportation and Mobility. Um, I'm overseeing our new shared spaces program. Um, and we're working on streamlining the process for businesses and groups to install parklets and streeteries in our public right away. And if this is a term, it may be new to some people. Um, so I'll just do a quick sort of definitions here. Um, for parklets, so, so both parklets and streeteries are um, utilizing the public space as in uh, parking spaces, street space, walkways, um, and a parklet is open to the public. It's, it's transforming a parking space into a mini park. Um, a streetery is, um, is available for extended outdoor dining for a restaurant or a bar. So those are private spaces that are utilizing, you know, the, the a parking space or street. Um, and I've also included pop-up parklets and streeteries. This is, um, these would be more temporary um, installed with low cost materials for um, either a certain event or a seasonal um, opportunity. But these are all examples of, we're calling them shared spaces. Um, and so sticking on this, uh, this theme of economic recovery um, and sort of why this program came about right now. Um, so in response to, to COVID-19, our city of Tucson mayor and council um, approved a zoning relief that allowed for the temporary expansion of restaurant seating and it um, outdoor seating. So I've included two photos here. Of, this is Pinka and Elliot's. Um, so it allowed businesses to extend um, their seating and their operations into um, the public right of way, um, both allowing them to reopen during this time and um, while meeting social distancing requirements. Um, and this program has been seen as um, extremely um, beneficial and successful at helping businesses during um, this extremely challenging time. Um, and throughout the city, we've seen an increased demand for outdoor dining, outdoor spaces, um, outdoor spaces where people feel safe to um, gather and spend time together. Um, so building off of that, um, we are now exploring options to make this emergency response a permanent ongoing program. Um, and exploring options and seeing what the community is interested in, in terms of um, extending it beyond just outdoor dining, but potentially outdoor retail or outdoor community spaces. Um, and a big piece of this is streamlining the process. So making it easier and quicker for businesses and organizations to go through um, the approval and application process. Um, as of right now, there's a number of different city departments that are working together to help streamline this process because um, each approval right now has to get, there's, you know, different um, permit fees, different permit approvals, depending on whether you're, um, have lights, have, um, are serving um, food or alcohol or, you know, each thing triggers another type of approval process. So, we are looking at developing um, design guidelines and a fast track sort of pre-approved route for businesses who want to um, install this and, and get this in right away. Um, and so through this process, we're also kicking off this week um, our public engagement and sort of information about it. So I'm sharing here two upcoming events. So one will be a virtual info session. Um, and it would be, to, to, I was going to say tomorrow, but it's in two days. So on um, Wednesday in the evening, um, here's the link and the phone number. And I've also included um, our website below, which has more information about all the events. And then we're also going to be doing an in-person pop-up parklet. So similar to what I had shown there with those temporary materials, but um, we'll be set up in front of Presta Coffee, the new Presta Coffee on Knight Street. Um, so it'll be outdoor drop-in 
7 to noon on this Friday and Saturday. Um, and if you aren't able to come to one of these, we also have an online survey that we're collecting information on. Um, and then this week, we'll also be hosting a specific listening session that's just for business owners who have participated in um, the temporary expansion of restaurant seating. Um, and our main goal with that is, is you know, they're, they have all the experience in it and we want to learn from their experience and their um, um, ways that we can make it easier and quicker for businesses to apply. So um, I'll keep it short and I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Thank you. So if you will put those uh, those dates and, and the contact or the online survey piece in the chat, that'd be great. That way everyone can capture that before they go. Because now um, I would like to turn to John Aldecoa. Uh, John is a third generation Tucsonan who's well integrated in local Tucson culture. He has over 25 years of management experience with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Master's of Business Administration also from the University of Arizona. His day job is as a national IT program manager with CVS Healthcare, supporting enterprise security across the US. And by night and weekends, he's affectionately known as Brother John of Brother John's Beer, Bourbon and Barbecue. John started his career in the restaurant industry at age 15, working at various pizza places until opening DJ's Pizza Pub and Grill in 1993 with his brother, David. He's an active member of the Tucson community, involved in several community organizations Organizations such as Anytown, Arizona, Tucson International Mariachi Conference, Girl Scouts of Southern Arizona, and Theta Tau Professional Engineering Fraternity. He currently serves as president of Theta Tau Housing Corporation, an Arizona nonprofit corporation that provides student housing for engineering students at the University of Arizona. I love telling you about John, but he's here today to talk with us a little bit about his experience and how he's navigated through this past year and just some of these programs that he's heard about today, how that might be of help. So John, I wanna turn it over to you for a few moments. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, thankful to be here. I kind of feel a loss of words after all these wonderful presenters here. I, I feel quite unprepared compared to what I've seen. So I <laughs> hope we'll I can bring it, some value. <laughs> we'll make it easy on you. I, I just applaud, first of all, thank you for surviving right I th and and I'm curious as how your year was for you and then how you see it moving forward well I, I will tell you that the programs that the SBA put forward on um, the PPP uh the first and second round were instrumental in our survival and so you know Stephen and and the SBA thank you um really uh Brother John's is a unique situation because we're a 10,000 square foot restaurant we're not typical uh, restaurant size um, so which actually at first was a disadvantage because my operating costs are so expensive and then we got shut down we basically went from wonderful revenue to zero um, literally overnight and um, but um, with the PPP we were able to survive over the summer and then we, we had just enough business and the fact that I, I literally removed half my tables and chairs and I still could feed 150 people that was only 40 percent capacity right my occupancy is 300 50 so I, so I had open space and so um we were more fortunate than other restaurants that you know have smaller footprints and then i also had a pretty large outdoor area that i was able to um to uh rem uh, mediate and um, renovate so to speak to make it more uh, accommodating for folks and so it, it's been um it's been a, a struggle to get there um and uh, but we did just enough to hang on and like i said a combination of the ppp first and second round really solidified our existence. And then, um, and I did apply for the Restaurant Relief Act as well. So we're still in line as a minority owned business, me and my brother, um, you know, being a Mexican American descent, um, we're able to qualify that first 21 day, but we're, uh, we're still, uh, we're still in line. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with that. But um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been a long road. Um, there were times when Literally, it was just my five managers and um, a couple of dishwashers and a cook, and that's all we needed for a 10,000 square foot restaurant for a Friday night. You know, was, <laughs> which is um, which was uh, interesting. I kind of said that we were a uh, 10,000 square foot barbecue truck for a good six months. It felt like 
<laughs> I'm curious, are you seeing the challenges that Jewel described as when she hears from her industry oh. partners? Are you having challenges getting ramped back up and, and getting the people you need? Well, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 she described it perfectly. Um, I think the, the hospitality industry in particular was really hit because our industry was shut down. So the people that want to work and that, you know, are have that motivation and that drive to, to, to want to keep working, they found out the jobs pretty quickly. I have several friends of mine in the restaurant business, you know, not ownership, but on the working side, they now work at Amazon. They started working at car dealerships. They went into construction because all those industries are booming. And so these same motivated people that were in our industry, they, they left the industry. And, and, and the ones that, that didn't leave the industry, I'm not sure I want to hire them to begin with. <laughs> they don't want to work. So it's kind of a, a catch-22. So we lost a lot of good, good, good resources, good career hospitality folks to other industries that were thriving um, during this time. Um, I talked to the owner of Patio Connection down the street, but he couldn't keep patio furniture in his shelves. He was back ordered on, you know, he had his best sales you know, that he's ever had before. And then the, 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 some of the pizza places actually did better numbers this year with a shut down dining room because they had delivery in place and they succeeded and excelled in this environment. Um, so the, the, the more destination location like Brother John's, you know, we, we really were, were handcuffed, you know, during this time. Um, so yeah, it was, and the tricky part for us was when the governor just kind of out of the blue said, I lift all restrictions. And then all of a sudden the, we went from doing 30% of our normal business to 130%, literally from one week into the next. And, and I, I was just ill prepared. And, and um, it was, it was a, quite a challenge um, literally to where I took more tables out of my restaurant to control because my kitchen couldn't keep up with the demand because I didn't have the skilled labor in the kitchen to, to keep up with the food. <laughs> so. It was it was tough. It was tough. We're in the front of the house. We are we are staffed up now, pretty close. To what we need back of the house is still um, are, is still a challenge. I'm looking for skilled chefs. Um, I talked to an executive chef that um, we, we're, he's a roofer now. He's, he's, he's you know he's doing construction, and uh, he's not sure he wants to come back because his construction work is, seems less stressful <laughs> than running the kitchen. <laughs> so, it's, I don't know about July when it's 110 outside, but. <laughs> so what do you have to do creatively to encourage or recruit people? Are there some things that you found to be successful that, that others might consider in their own businesses? Well, for us, I mean, we do have to be more competitive with our pay. Um, I mean, that's, that's a given um, and, and that's a reality. Uh, so we are, we, are, um, we are offering more than we ever have um, for our back of the house folks. In addition, um, we are pretty aggressively, you know, we're posting all the web, all the job sites, and we go ahead and, and um, are pay for the service to get it pushed out there across across all the digital um, ports that are available. Um, I also um, reached out to our folks at La Frontera. They have a placement program for for rehabilitation. I'm here in Tucson to to place people in into work. Um, I haven't reached out to Jewel, though. I think I should, though, after hearing this presentation. <laughs> we should, we should, should be talking as well. But I think, and then just getting the word on the street with my, my employees I do have. Um, we, do, we, do, we do offer a referral program as well and um, giving folks a little referral bonus if they can find somebody for us as well. So um, all, all that is, is what we're doing. And just really trying to, to uh, bring people on. One of the things that Jewel mentioned is the stress level for the people that are working. There was a time there you know, where people were getting burnt out because, you know, they're, they're, they're working way too much and it's really stressful not having the support. So um, we definitely uh, are trying to create that work-life balance and be mindful of that as well. Try to keep people, tell them, they don't want you working 60, 70 hours a week, you know, 45 you know, if you know as a manager, under 50, yeah, that's all I, all I expect, you know, between 40 and 50 as a management staffer, and we don't like anybody working overtime either, so. How has it been with, you know, going through the, the mask mandates and now sort of that, those requirements being lifted? It, are there some things, though, related to protocol and safety that you will keep going forward in your restaurant, whether front of house or back of house? Well, I, I'll tell you what, we actually... Um, put in a air purification system at Brother John's back in July of last year. And it's um, the professor here at the U of A is actually uh, works for NASA and it's the same system they used 
in the International Space Center using um, photocatalytic oxidation technology. Being an engineer, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a technology nerd anyway, so I love technology. And um, we've had that in our restaurant since, uh, since July of last year when we first opened up our doors um, to full dining. So uh, that's not going anywhere. It actually removes 98.9% of all pathogens, which includes smoke. I'm a barbecue place, so I would come home every night smelling like a barbecue pit, regardless if I was in the pit or not. I've just been in the restaurant. Um, and I don't, that doesn't happen anymore. So that's been a benefit. So the restaurant actually smells nice and clean and fresh because the air is purified. Your so dogs that, that's are probably not happy with you. <laughs> I was going to say, your dogs, <laughs> yeah, our animals like it when we smell like uh, all that good barbecue. <laughs> well, I bring, I bring them bones all the time, so they're, they're, they're not complaining. They're, they're in good shape, very spoiled. But no, but so, so that's going to stay in, in place. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, that's a benefit that I think will help during, during regular flu and cold seasons as well. Because it actually, th these particles are like being outside. So that they stay charged in the air and it, they don't go away unless they're consumed. So when the and restaurant's empty, it fills up with these particles, these ions all night long. So when people come in, you know, they, uh, if they, someone sneezes, it's going to end right there. So they travel across the room. That's so fantastic. It's actually pretty neat technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, it's it's, for, it's cheaper than HEPA filters. I'm just surprised that we don't have it as a standard, you know, for all enclosed space. But I actually shared stuff, with, uh, Jewel, with um, oh, I forgot, I forgot his name. He he represents uh, Pima Pima College with the uh, Tucson Originals um, on behalf of your guys' program, and I I shared uh, um, that technology with him as well. So I don't know, if you guys are gonna yeah. join us in that. <laughs> And then you learned, you know, you've had a patio experience already, I think, even before the pandemic, but listening to Krista and how many of the other restaurants are enjoying um, use of that and, and want to have that more permanent beyond the pandemic, um, they're understanding the benefits of that outdoor dining. How has your patio experience evolved and, and you know, was that helpful for you during that time as well? Oh, oh, very much so. The patio, the outdoor seating um, is Tucson, in all honesty. We, we are uh, the perfect place to be outside from 9, 10, arguably 11 months out of the year. I mean, there's one month and monsoon is kind of rough. But, um, but yeah, so we've, um, we've actually, because I actually told you I took tables out of my restaurant, it's because of the patio. My patio would fill up and people would exclusively want only patio seating now since, since the pandemic. So, um, we're looking um, with the, the extension of hopefully this, the Restaurant Act, we will be investing heavily into our patio seating, um, both on the east patio on Stone, as well as our beer garden that's already in place on the north side as well. So that, that's going to be a big investment of ours going forward for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time and what I know is a busy time because we are starting to see lines outside the doors now at our restaurants again. We're very grateful for that and we thank you for your perseverance and everything that you've helped done to help our small businesses, um, your neighbors in, in small business as well. So thank you, John. And thanks to all my speakers, uh, Stephen, Jewel, Krista. I appreciate you taking some time out this afternoon with all of us. I know our audience has enjoyed hearing your stories and your resources that are available. So uh, with that, I like to keep us on time. I'll wrap us up and we'll be back next month on Monday, June 28th at 3 p.m. So be sure to watch your inbox for the announcements and registration link. We'll keep you connecting for success. And don't forget, you can call our City of Tucson Economic Initiative Small Business Assistance Line at 520-837-4100 and visit Connect Tucson Tucson.com so you can stay up to date and, and access all of those resources, sign up for our email newsletter and updates and see these webinars there again. So with that, have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Barb.